This lecture discusses water quality testing and biological monitoring. Support for the development of this lesson has been provided by the National Science Foundation through the Ohio University Mode of Knowledge and the Science Classroom Program. Take a look at these samples of water. Which of these samples would you feel comfortable swimming in? Would you eat fish that you caught from any of these waters? If so, which one? What about drinking? Which water would you be willing to consume? Did your answers to these three questions differ? Consider those three questions again, but this time after you know the sources of the water. The first sample is pond water, the second sample is tap water, and the third sample is tap water with three teaspoons of salt added. Did any of your answers change now that you know the sources? How did you make your decisions? When we decide whether or not to swim, fish, or drink water, we depend on how clean we perceive the water to be. But what is clean? How do we know if water is clean or not? Does it depend only on the way it looks? We found out that we can't base our judgment on looks alone. We certainly wouldn't want to drink salty water, but it looks almost exactly like the filtered water. What else do you think we should check to decide if water is healthy or not? Share your thoughts with the class. Why should we care about water quality? Probably the first thing we all think of is for drinking. Some rivers, like the Ohio River, are a source of drinking water for entire communities. As long as our drinking water is safe, why does the quality of other streams, lakes, and rivers matter? These bodies of water are home to a multitude of species, the diversity of species is necessary to maintain stability of the ecosystem. If the water quality is too bad to support even one of the species, then everything will be thrown out of balance. Are there any other reasons why water quality might matter to us? As we mentioned before, we go swimming, boating, and fishing in these waters. We wouldn't want to be exposed to water that is tainted with pollutants or might pose a health hazard. We certainly wouldn't want to eat fish that have dangerous chemicals accumulated in their bodies. At first, we might not realize the importance of water quality, thinking that we won't be directly affected by it as long as we aren't drinking it. But as we've seen, we're all connected. Pollutants travel from the sources into groundwater or surface water. We already mentioned that by consuming fish, we could also be consuming pollutants. But even if we don't eat the fish, the polluted water might be used for drinking water, or it could be consumed by cattle or other animals that we may eat. Or perhaps it will be used for irrigation of crops that feed us or our livestock. That means the pollutants could travel from the source to humans, through crops and animals that we eat, including fish, through our drinking water, or through direct exposure during recreation. So how can we be sure the water quality is good? We take samples of the water for testing. Once we have a sample, what kind of tests should we do? To answer this question, let's think about what might be polluting the water. If we know what kind of pollutants could possibly be in the water, then we will know what kind of tests we should do. Think about some pollutants that might contaminate the water, and think about where those pollutants come from. Did anyone answer chemicals? How about sediments? Chemicals might come from industrial waste, from farms, like pesticides or fertilizers, and from urban runoff. Farms might also add sediments to the water as a result of agricultural processes. These are only a few types of pollutants and their sources. For more detailed information on pollutant types, sources, and remediation, watch the water pollution video that is part of the water pollution lesson. What do you think these pollutants will do to the water? What do you think will change in the water? Will all of the changes be visible? When 
we do water quality testing, we check eight parameters, pH, conductivity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, turbidity, nitrates, phosphates, and E. coli. Let's go through each of these tests in detail and discuss why they're important. pH is a measure of alkalinity. pH ranges from 1 to 14, with lower numbers being more acidic, higher numbers being more basic, and 7 being the neutral pH. If we look at this scale, hydrochloric acid, the acid in our stomachs, is listed as having a pH of 3, and bleach has a pH of 13. We see that pure water falls between 7 and 8, so it's fairly close to neutral. When we test water quality, we like to see a pH between 6.5 and 8. This range is neither too acidic nor too basic. It represents the perfect range for aquatic life. We can test pH using an electric handheld meter or pH strips like those used for testing swimming pools. Conductivity is a measure of how well the water can carry an electric current. Conductivity increases as more charged ions like salts and minerals enter the water. We can see from this diagram that many of the beverages we drink, like orange and apple juice, have relatively high conductivity measured in millisiemen as compared to water, which is measured in micro or nanosiemen. Remember that the prefix milla denotes 10 to the minus 3, micro denotes 10 to the minus 6, and nano is 10 to the minus 9. The optimal range for conductivity is between 40 and 800 microsiemen. We measure conductivity using either a handheld meter, like that used for pH, or using a data sonde. We must also check the temperature of the water, since it plays a role in the health of aquatic life. If the water is too cold, the fish will suffer from hypoxia, which means they run out of dissolved oxygen. If the water is too warm, their immune systems will become weak and they will be more susceptible to diseases. In order to survive, fish need a temperature range between 18 and 24 degrees Celsius. We can measure temperature using the data sonde. Dissolved oxygen is just what it sounds like. Oxygen in gaseous form dissolved in water. Fish need the dissolved oxygen like we need air. The optimal range for dissolved oxygen is 2 to 14 milligrams per liter. We can measure dissolved oxygen using the data sonde or the Winkler method. For more information on the Winkler method, watch the video that is part of the Winkler method lesson. Turbidity describes how much material is suspended in the water. It's basically a quantitative measurement of how clear the water is. We can measure turbidity using a turbidity tube. We fill the tube with the water and slowly start releasing the water until we can see the pattern on the Secchi disk at the bottom of the tube. The reading is in centimeters, but how do we interpret this reading? For example, let's say we have two different water samples. For sample A, the turbidity tube reading is 10 centimeters. For sample B, the turbidity tube reading is 27 centimeters. Which water is clearer? Take a few moments to discuss your thoughts with the class. Sample B is clear because it had a higher turbidity tube reading. Let's think about why this is true. If we have a high turbidity tube reading, that means we could see the Secchi disk pattern before we released too much water. But for sample A, we had to release a lot of water before we could see the pattern, meaning that more solids were suspended in sample A. That means we prefer higher turbidity tube readings. Nitrates and phosphates are not necessarily bad. They are both essential nutrients in the ecosystem, but at the right levels. If nitrates and phosphates are excessive, they will cause eutrophication, a process of algae overgrowth and decay that reduces dissolved oxygen levels so much that it kills the fish. If nitrate levels are above 10 mg per liter, or phosphate levels are above 2 mg per liter, then the water is considered unsafe and polluted. We can measure nitrates and phosphates using test strips like the ones for swimming pools, or using a colorimeter. E. coli is a fecal coliform found in the human digestive tract. While E. coli isn't nearly as dangerous as some of the other bacteria, protozoa, and viruses present in human feces, it's easy to test for and therefore a good indicator that human feces are contaminating the water. 
We test for E. coli by mixing a 1 ml water sample with agar. We pour the mixture in a petri dish and wait 48 hours for the colonies to incubate. After the 48 hour period, we count the E. coli colonies in the sample. Both E. coli colonies and other fecal coliform colonies from animal feces will be visible. The E. coli colonies will appear blue and other fecal coliforms appear red. Only the blue colonies are counted. Looking at these water quality parameters alone doesn't give us a full picture of what's happening in the water. Can you think of something else that we might check? We can learn a lot about water quality by examining the living things present in the water body. This is called biological monitoring. Biological monitoring involves physically going out to the body of water and checking the organisms. What kind of organisms do you think we should check? If you said bugs, fish, or plants, then you're correct. Each group tells us something different about the water. Let's see what their stories can tell us. Bugs, or macroinvertebrates to be precise, usually don't travel too far, so they give us an idea of site-specific impacts. They also have relatively short life cycles, so we're able to see short-term variations. Since macroinvertebrates span a broad range of trophic levels, and pollution tolerance levels, we can get an idea of how pollutants are moving up the food chain and how bad the pollution is. One of the biggest advantages of checking macroinvertebrates is that they are abundant even in small streams where large fish may not be present. Where fish are present, they can give us information about long-term effects since they have a longer lifespan than macroinvertebrates. Fish also move around more, so they give us an idea of how pollution is affecting a broader range of habitats. Like macroinvertebrates, fish cover a variety of trophic levels, but fish are also at the top of the food chain, which gives us an idea of how concentrated pollutants will be higher up in the food chain before reaching humans. Plants, like periphyton, also give us more clues about water pollution. Periphyton can tell us about short-term impacts of several pollutants, especially since it's directly affected by both physical and chemical changes in the body of water. It is also very sensitive to certain pollutants, like herbicides, that might not have much of an effect on macroinvertebrates or fish at lower concentrations. We now know that we can check bugs, fish, and plants for biological monitoring of water quality. But what does this really tell us? How can we classify how healthy or polluted the water is? There are several methods of bioassessment, but one simple and common method is the biotic index. The biotic index uses insects as a measure of water pollution. It categorizes insects into three classes based on their pollution tolerance. The insects may be class one, pollution sensitive, class two, moderately tolerant, or class three, pollution tolerant. Let's look at the insects that are part of each class. If you've ever been out around a stream or a pond, some of these insects might look familiar to you. Class 1 insects include mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, crayfish, and fingernail clams. Class 2 insects include the water penny, aquatic sowbug, scud, dragonfly, damselfly, and hellgramot. Class 3 insects include the black fly, midge fly, tabanus, crane fly, snails, flatworms, water strider, and water boatman. After we classify the insects we find as class 1, class 2, or class 3, we can calculate the biotic index. The biotic index equals 2 times the class 1 insect plus the class 2 insect. But the number of class 1 and class 2 in the formula does not represent the number of insects you found in each class. It represents the number of different species that you found. Once you calculate the biotic index, you compare it to this range of values to check whether it indicates clean, moderate pollution, or gross pollution of the water. 
we can see that higher numbers mean cleaner water. When we calculate biotic index, why do you think we double the number of class 1 insects and don't include the number of class 3 insects? Take a few minutes to think about this and discuss your ideas with the class. Remember that class 1 insects are pollution sensitive. When we multiply by 2, we're highlighting the importance of having class 1 insects. If we have many class 1 insects and double that number, we will get a high biotic index that will be in the clean range. We don't include class 3 insects because they are pollution tolerant, so they should not increase the biotic index. Let's try an example of using the biotic index to classify the water pollution for three different streams. Stream site 1 is an unforested area, stream site 2 is a forested area downstream of farms, and stream site 3 is a storm discharge pipe near a mall parking lot. At stream site 1, we found the following macroinvertebrates in our sample. We found 27 caddisflies from two different species, 18 mayflies from two different species, 9 stoneflies from three different species, 19 midges from two different species, one dragonfly, and two beetles from one species. Using your notes, pause and classify these insects as class 1, 2, or 3. Which insects were class 1? The caddisflies, mayflies, and stoneflies. Do we use 54 as the number of class 1 in our biotic index formula? No because we only have seven different taxa. Which of the remaining insects were class two? Just the midges, and we have two different taxa. The dragonfly and beetles are class three insects, of which we have two different taxa. Let's use this information to calculate the biotic index. Since we have two times the number of class one taxa, plus the number of class two taxa, we should write the biotic index equals 2 times 7 plus 2, which gives us a biotic index of 16. Looking at our chart, this stream is in the clean range. Now let's check stream site 2. This time, try identifying the classes of insects and calculating the biotic index on your own. We'll go through the solution once you've finished. Pause the video until you have finished. How did you classify this stream? Was it clean, moderate pollution, or gross pollution? The caddisflies, mayflies, and stoneflies are class 1, and we have five different taxa. The blackflies, midges, and craneflies are class 2, and we have three different taxa. The beetles are the only class 3 insects, and we have only one taxa. If we calculate the biotic index, we have 2 times 5 plus 1 which gives us a value of 11. Did you conclude that this stream is also clean? Finally, we have stream site 3. Pause the video and calculate the biotic index on your own before we go through the solution. At this site, we have one tax of class 1, five different taxa of class two, and two different taxa of class three. Our biotic index calculation should be two times one plus two, which gives us a value of four. This stream is moderately polluted.